watching the Forefront Church video podcast. And wherever you're at viewing online, we just want to say thank you and welcome. And one of the ways that we can help connect with you is we want to hear from you and where you're at and how we can help. And so head over to ForefrontChurch.info after the message and click the Connect tab. It's a great way for us to help you along your spiritual journey as you connect with God and learn about Jesus. And so sit back, relax. We hope that you're challenged and encouraged from today's message. excited for today. I'm excited for the next four weeks as we tune in to these ideals of what it means to be, experience, and understand what is enough. Today's going to be a little bit heavier, a little less, uh, I guess I love storytelling. I think that humor bonds us together. There'll be little pockets of humor because we're going to need a chance to kind of and breathe and kind of cut the tension in the room, but today's a little different. And the next four weeks will be different at large, and we'll get to that in a second, but I want you to be prepared today and ready. And so if you have a Bible, turn over to Genesis chapter two. If you don't know your way around your Bible, that's okay because it's the first book in there, and so you can look like a pro if that's you. And so it's the very first book in the Bible, Genesis chapter two. If you don't have one, two ways. You can go out to the Get Connected table after service, grab a Bible, or you could stop now and do that if you want. That's totally fine. Or you can also go to ForefrontChurch.info, and there's two tabs there. One's a Bible tab. The other is a Notes tab. So at ForefrontChurch.info, everything you have is right there for you. And you might notice that we will be slowly phasing out our mobile app. Now, nobody go crazy. Not only will ForefrontChurch.info have everything, and you could save it to your home screen. Apple has changed around some things, which means that there's certain apps that kind of get kicked out. It's a long explanation, which I'm not going to get into today. But the good news is we have everything there for you right at ForefrontChurch.info at your fingertips. And so use those tools as you turn over to Genesis chapter 2. And I want to kind of prep the next four weeks for us. And and I want you really, and I hope, to make a commitment because I know you and I know looking at this schedule that we have and this life that we lead, the fact that we're even going to be talking about a topic like rest today, I know that most of us would say, I have a difficulty resting because I'm really busy, yeah. Now, in this four-week series, I really, if you don't get anything else, I hope that you understand this, and maybe if this piques your interest, whets your appetite, whatever, when we look at a series titled Enough, in this series, the biblical concepts taught over the next four weeks have saved my marriage, my career as a pastor, my parenting, my friendships, and ultimately my faith. And, um, and so today is a little bit more vulnerable than I normally get. The, the subject matter is, is kind of heavy. And so if you have uh, little ones, don't worry. I'm going to keep things very kind of, you'll be able to understand. They might not, um, and that's good. But these things, I'm on the other side of all four of the things that we're going to talk about. I haven't arrived. I haven't made it. I work on them every single day of my life. But the next four things I have found freedom in over the next few weeks And it's a beautiful thing. Today, we're going to to look at rest, which for many of us, and we say this, and I do believe that it's true, that sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is take a nap. Okay, you can use that line later today too, by the way. If they're like, hey, I really need you to, like for instance, our house is already decorated for Christmas. Don't judge us. (laughs) 
My wife is Mrs. Claus. We've been married 13 years, together for 15. That is the biggest of our concerns, and I'm okay with that. So she decorated, and I put it all back up in the attic. But maybe for you, you go, man, today I need some rest, and that would be okay. But we're not just going to talk about physical rest, and we'll get to that later. But in week two, we're going to look at contentment. It's not something in the day and age where we have $1,000 phones coming out and people are lining up around the block to get them. Contentment's not something that we're really known for. And in week three, we're going to look at identity. And this does not get defined. I'm going to let a little bit of the cat out of the bag. This doesn't get defined by your relationship status or lack thereof, the number of kids that you have, the house you have, the car that you drive, the apartment that you live in, your sexual orientation, the sports team that you cheer for, even if they're awful, go Giants. Your identity is not wrapped up in these pieces either. It's taken me a long time to learn some of these things. And in the last week, we're going to look at cost. Now, before you, especially if you're new with us today and you're like, oh, here's where they get you. They're going to want my money, cost of falling. No, that actually has nothing to do with finances at all. We're going to look at the cost of how we follow Jesus and, it, and the cost that he paid and what that looks like in your life and in mine. Four weeks, you can choose whether or not you want to follow and come back and be a part of that because I can't make you do anything. But maybe to make a commitment at, man, I really want to learn what it means to live in enough life. We're starting off in this topic of rest. And, and I love the way that the writers of the Bible, now we believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God. What that means is that God, now, now people go, oh, God can make creation. God can do this. God can do that. But God can't write a book. I'm like, J.K. Rowling can write a book. I think God can take care of these things and what he wants in there and what he doesn't. Because he made all the people that you've read. And so we believe that this isn't just a book, that it's the inspired word of God that, that directs our life, but doesn't just simply direct it, that it's life-giving words and an account that you and I can learn from to guide us closer to God and his son, Jesus. And so in this topic of rest, I love the way some of the writers put things, and we'll revisit each of these later. Oh, that I had the wings of a dove, that I would fly away and be at rest. Every time I read this, I think of Jenny in Forrest Gump. Dear God, make me a bird so I can fly far, far, far away. <laughs> Some of you, that's all you're going to sit in the rest of the time. Life is like a... No. Or the writer in Jeremiah shares, that this is what the Lord says, stand at the crossroads and look, and the dudes will not ask for directions. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it. And you will find what for your souls? Rest. The writer in Matthew shares, Come to me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find what for your souls? Rest. Back in the Old Testament of the Bible in the book of Exodus, the Lord replies, My presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Psalm 46.10 he says, be still. And the Old Testament and New Testament are written in different languages. The Old Testament is written in Hebrew. The New Testament's written in Greek. And when you translate and kind of dig down and parse out the Hebrew, when we see be still, uh, a modern day vernacular of being able to put that would say glorious rest. Be at glorious rest and know that I am God and I will be with you and I will be exalted among the nations and exalted in the earth. For some of us, these words fall on us and we're like, man, I need that. Living in a culture that is very heavy and difficult, man, I need rest. Because life can be chaotic. I, I know that all too well. That's why just recently I stepped off of all forms of social media and I'm not watching the news. It's beautifully refreshing. All of the things still happen. We still went trick-or-treating with our kids. I still found out about current events from other adults who binge watch the news. I don't see anybody's complaining. And I don't see any ads. It's nice. There's a peace that happens when we kind of pull ourselves away and just rest in who God is. 
got an email from a forefronter a couple of years ago, and they still attend here and are thriving. But at the time, things were very difficult for them. You see, they were searching for and trying to figure out this precept, this idea, this concept, this value of rest. This is what they shared with me in part of their email. Every time life gets good, my connection with the church gets distant. I know that's none of you guys, just this person. Watch it in the summer. Life's good. I'm traveling. I'll see you in the fall. I just come when it's convenient. Then life crumbles and I run back. It's a grueling cycle I could avoid if I just aim myself at God regularly. If I prayed daily, came on Sundays, and actually spent time with people from church to let them in. I feel stupid saying it, but one of the messages I remember vividly is so true. You cannot fill God-sized shoes and expect to carry the weight you're going to break. I broke, and now I'm seeking safety because here it is safe and it's where I can find rest. See, I think we're all searching for that at some point in time. That's why everyone aims their 401ks or whatever you want to do at retirement to just sit and live and soak in. But what if God intended us not to simply wait till the end of a career, which I'm not sure that God is all that concerned about, but more about daily finding rest in him. You see, there's a few working definitions, and I think most people work from this first definition of rest. This is what most people, most people believe that rest is placing incremental events in a schedule until there's no room to move or breathe, leading to anxiety, uneasiness, fatigue, and anguish, but at least my social media and conversations are full of how busy I am, which shows I'm important and have worth. Sure, nobody in here operates in that. Move, got to go to the next thing. You see somebody out and around town, you go, oh man, it's been a long time. We need to catch up, man. I know you and whatever, man. I know it's been a while. We really want to get together, but we've all been so busy. We love that word. We wear it as a badge of honor because if I can say I'm busy, I have value, I have worth. My kids are in 45 sports, doing all these things, and I'm a good parent. I told a parent the other day via email, their kid's in three sports and we never get to see him here. My kid really wants to be here, but we have a lot going on. So what you're telling your kid is that hopefully one day baseball will save them. But Jesus won't. Not not my word, yours. Because of your actions. You see, we get so busy under the guise of busyness, we forget a God that really desires for us to not be busy, but be engaged with Him. And so we put a lot of things above Him. And I get it. I totally get it. We go out late on a Saturday night. Man, I'm really tired. I'll eventually make it to 5 p.m. Sure. Oh, man, we're going to wake up early. We're going to do it. And Oh, we got to go up early because there's a football game. Most of the teams are awful. (laughs) it's okay. And most of them don't play nine o'clock games. Come to the 8.30 service. Oh, well, I got this thing. I got this trip. I got this whatever. And I'm not guilty. Anybody, we go, my, my family, we go away. But there's at some point where we say that our schedule is packed so full that Jesus in church is a supplement and a piece to put in a schedule. But what is the real definition of rest? See, rest is freedom from activity or labor, peace of mind or spirit. This is the very thing that God set forth in the beginning. We're going to get to that in a moment that God actually set a standard of rest. But I would contend the reason that we look at this and we just go, I cannot find rest is because we're like my friend that I read the email from. And well, even in my own life, see, when I think of rest, I think of these. How many of you guys ever had these in your room at one point in time or another? Yeah? If for some of you who don't have your reading glasses on and can't see me right now, whoo, um, i move all over. How many fingers am I holding? Uh, these are those little glow-in-the-dark stars. Uh, anybody want these? Hey, show of hands. There, or somebody, oh, somebody, I saw somebody throw them up. Whoa, oh gosh. I was like, I hope she <laughs> hit right in the face. Sorry, came to church, I got hit in the face. Um, Wasn't that funny? Sorry. When I think of rest, I think of these. See, when I was in the second grade at Lynn Haven Elementary School, I talked about it last week, 
in the second grade, my teacher would, they'd have those films. Any of you guys remember those where you had to put the tape in the little projector, then sync it up with the cassette tape? Some of you have no idea what a cassette tape is. If I handed you a pencil with this, you're going, what? Some of you know, you old school. And they would put the projector in and they would sync it up and you'd have to hit it at the right time and then boop, and then the projector would go on and she would dim the lights. See, when she would dim the lights, I sat next to this girl and, uh, and during these times, and I had no idea, I was so naive, there would be things that would happen in the darkness. And, uh, and I never told anybody until much later on. And uh, and I remember in, in my classroom, the teacher there had these stars all over the ceiling. And there was one at about, just about this angle, about this big that I remember I would just stare at waiting till everything was done. Just to lose myself and, and something else. And in that one moment, completely wrecked my trajectory. It wrecked the way that I viewed relationships, the way that I viewed women, the way that I viewed God. God, where were you? Why didn't you uh, uh, fix things? Why didn't you do something to... To this kid, God, why didn't you protect me? There's a lot of things that, that hit you in those moments. And it makes you wonder, at least it did for me, and we've, every one of us have had or will have a life-altering moment that makes us pose the question, Am I enough? Is God enough? And is it worth it? In all of this, is it worth it to follow Him? And if you've sat there and you've had that question, if you've wrestled with that, if you've sat in angst with God, going, God, where were you? I just want rest. I don't want this anymore. I get it. For years, I would sleep with at least one light on, or a TV on, or noise. Didn't want it all to be in the darkness, because I knew and equated the darkness with hurt. Even when I would go out and I would see the stars and I would look up at them, all I could see were these and bringing back to the moment that that would happen. Go, God, where were you? God, I've heard you talk about love and grace and beauty, but God, I want to know if I'm enough. Is your Jesus enough? Can I find rest for my soul? And it starts with the example that God set. Now, I'm not saying when we hear these words that we all go, oh, I feel better the moment that I see that God said it. Everything's fine. And we're all going to walk away feeling free and living lightly. It takes time. But the beauty is God is with you in all the time that it takes. Where you've been holding over in Genesis 2, there's been essentially, if you've never heard about this, in the very beginning, is in the beginning there was God, and, all, and, and God created light and darkness and all these things, and he moved through and made the earth and the solar system and the water and land and animals and cats. I think those were part of the fall of man. But anyway, like made all this stuff, and eventually he creates man. He sees that it's not good for man to be alone, and he creates woman. Get through all this creation stuff until we get to day seven. And it says on day seven, and we'll get here in verses two and three of chapter two. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all of his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, he rested from all the work of created and had been done. God, there it is. God set a precedent. It is nap time on Sundays. Don't work. Don't do anything. Just enjoy life, worship, be free and rest. See, here's the one problem with that is that the Bible in the biblical account doesn't end in Genesis 2. There's always a little bit of a catch. And well, the catch comes in the form of you and I. We have a tendency to screw things up or what we would label here within the context of the Bible sin. 
Sin means that there's a target, think archery, and God wants us to hit the mark, but more often than not, we miss the mark. Now, you may hit it sometimes. I hit it sometimes. Most of the time, we hit kind of near the target. We go, whoo, that's good enough. It's not like horseshoes. It's either all or nothing. And we get in this place where we sin and fall short. And man and woman, woman eats the apple. Guys, don't blame it on her because some man was standing right there. She turns it and goes like, derp, and he eats it. And so man and woman sin. They do the one thing God told them not to do. And it ushers in all this. All of a sudden they realize they're naked, which really is weird because in a perfect world, all of us, this environment would be way different. And so thank you for wearing clothes today. And so sin is introduced And for the next almost 1,500 years, man is toiling and hurting and working. Life is hard. Life is difficult. They're up and down. God, we love you. God, we hate you. God, we love you. God, we hate you. These are the people in the world, God's chosen people, the Israelite Israelite, Israelite nation. They're up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. And they find themselves in captivity and in slavery. And it's almost 1,500 years later in the middle of toiling and hurting and working and life is hard and they're looking up at the stars in the midst of being in a foreign land going, God, where are you? We're working and slaving away. We just want quiet. God, we want rest. And it isn't until 1496 B.C. that God intervenes. Now God was there. God was listening. God was able but even just like as if you're a parent and you watch your kid, you don't always jump in even in the middle of their, their idiocracy. Sometimes you just watch and go, you're going to have to learn. Sometimes they do it for a really long time. And if you're a good parent, there's moments where you have to step away even if you see them going down that road. Why? Because they, you can't make them do those things. And God the Father is watching, he's seeing, and he goes, this is the moment. And he shares with them as they're in captivity, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians, under the umbrella of hurt, shame, slavery, all of this. Basically, I am going to free you. What? I will free you from being slaves to them and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and the mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. What he's saying is you have heard, and he's giving them a picture, a glimpse of redemption that they don't know, but we do on the other side, a couple thousand years later, that God is good and God sent Jesus to redeem mankind once and for all. And he's giving them a glimpse of rest that we can find fully in the work, nature, person, and beauty of Jesus. You see, and if I could encourage you in any way possible as we start this four-week journey, when you've asked the question of how do I find rest? Well, it starts with Jesus. You see, we have to experience redemption and restoration. And that restoration leads to glorious rest because Jesus is enough. Your identity, your help, your hope, your all this stuff is not in your dating relationship or your singleness. It is not in your kids or your lack of kids. It is not in your job, your occupation, your sports team, your house, your car, your phone, your email. None of those things. If you want to experience rest, it starts with Jesus and the cross and redemption and restoration in Him alone. Because Jesus is enough. And the problem that most individuals face is that they try to supplement life and put Jesus as a part of the pie of life. Like I have work, I have family, I have whatever. I'm going to put a little bit of Jesus right in there and everything will be fine. That is not the way the gospel, which is the good news that Jesus came, died, conquered death so that you and I can experience redemption and hope. That is not the way that it works. But most of us operate that way. Why? Because we operate from the first definition of rest. Incremental moments where Jesus is kind of on my schedule when I feel like it, when there's not football and work and relationships and trips and things and stuff and kids and all these things. And then all of a sudden, there's Jesus. 
It's that our lives, when you become a follower of Jesus, it is not a portion of your life. It's everything in your life now becomes a part of what it means to follow Jesus. It's when I'm a pastor, I'm a Christian pastor. I'm a dad, I'm a Christian dad. When I'm a husband, I'm a Christian husband. Because Christian is over the umbrella, the banner, over everything else that I'm a part of. It's because Jesus is enough. That even if my family were to fall off the planet, that even if my job were to collapse and the church catch on fire and be done, which please don't do that, like all that stuff would happen and everything, if all was lost, Jesus would still be the one that sustains me. He's the same one that sustains you. But the reason when we operate from rest just being a peace and shoving everything in, this is why things get bad. And I want to talk to you about four things very briefly that get in the way and fight against your true rest in Jesus. The first one of those is that you and I can become shackled to something. We read that verse early on. It won't be on the screen, but I'll reread it again. Oh, that I had wings of a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. And, and I don't want, when we hear shackled, we think of all the bad things. We think of, you know, like when we were little kids and we played cops and robbers and someone got the handcuffs, whatever. Now that's true. You are not. And when we think about shackled, we think of the worst and the ugly and all that. I get it. I want to encourage you. You are not the worst thing that you've done and experienced. And you can be shackled to that, which is why you don't find rest. But you can also be shackled to, and you are not the best thing that you've done or experienced. I see people that celebrate their job so highly that their job becomes savior and supplements it over Jesus. That they go, oh man, on this, on that I travel, I'm so important. I fly first class everywhere I go and I'm so busy, but that's just I'm really successful at my job. Cool. You can be successful at your job and still go to hell. And that sounds awful. And I know it sounds very pointed, but it's true. Because here's the thing, I may only have one chance to share with you that Jesus is enough. And your job cannot get you a relationship with Jesus. And we can be shackled to things. I see people all the time, and sometimes it can be great things. You may be like, man, my family's awesome. My kids are the most important thing, which I would say this. If you're married, you're sending an awful message to your spouse. My kids are my world or whatever. Cool, one day your kids are going to grow up and go, and then you're going to be stuck with the second citizen in your house. If your kids are the most important thing in your world, your values are totally screwed up because your kids are going to, hopefully you're raising them up to be self-sufficient little human beings that we don't have to coddle and you send them off on their way and then you get to celebrate, I don't know, with the person that was there before you made those little humans in the first place. But then what do we do? We put all these things and we get shackled to things that are beautiful, that are amazing or things that are hard and we get shackled to something and we go, I can't find rest. Sometimes we can't find rest because we're shackled to shame. Sometimes we can't find rest because we're shackled to all those things that we think make us awesome. The only thing that makes you awesome is the fact that you're God's. That's the only thing. Anything else is icing on the cake and it could totally be gone tomorrow. The other piece of this that can lead us down that rabbit trail in not finding rest is refusing to obey God. We talked about that passage. It's over here. I'll reread it again. It says, this is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it and you will find rest for your soul. You and I stand at a crossroads daily. Every single one of our decisions either take us towards God or away from God. You are never sitting stagnant. I tell people all the time, they're like, man, I just feel like my life and everything is stagnant. It's like, no, you're not stagnant. You're either moving forward or moving backward. Well, I don't really feel like I'm doing anything. Well, if you don't feel like you're doing anything, you're moving backward. What do you mean by that? Every decision that you make, everything that you do in your faith, if you want to find rest in God and chase after God and follow God and just under his beauty and his grace, Every time you take a step or you stand still or you step backward, you are creating movement in some way. You stand still, your faith is moving backward. And sometimes we refuse because God's going, hey, I got this perfect path. We're like, no, I really walking down uh, this road full of hot coals and Legos and bare feet. Let's see how this takes me. And if you're a parent, you know what that kind of hell is like. Step on one of those in the middle of the night. You might lose your Jesus right there. And God goes, I have this great path for you. I have this beautiful direction for you. You can follow. And you go, ah, I think I know better. 
and you go along with it. I watch people concede all the time. Conceding isn't just changing and thinking you know better, it's disobeying God. And the thing is, being on the other side of some of these things, I can tell you with confidence that going down these paths don't end well. People go, oh, no, 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 I can't tell you the number of people. I seriously don't have enough fingers and toes for the number of people, especially in relationships. Christian, non-Christian, get together, it's totally going to work, date and evangelism, I'm going to win them, get whatever. They end up having kids, and this is usually the thing. I've watched tons of single moms and everything, is they come and they end up like four or five years later, they're sitting here with a kid, a couple kids, and I'm like, I don't know what happened. I go, cool, remember five years ago, we said, hey, that was a bad idea, because you can't make that person, oh, I was going to make them love Jesus. No, you can't. They have to decide to love Jesus. And I watch people walk down, I'm going to chase after my job, a relationship, all of these things. God goes, I have a better path for you. But we refuse to obey him. And when we do that, it leads to the third thing, which is embracing a false identity or spreading gossip and slander. Basically what this is saying is making ourselves better than we think we are or making other people feel awful so we can feel better about ourselves. Basically either we're an egomaniac or a bully. Then we go, I think because I don't find rest in life, because I can't really surrender to Jesus, I'm going to make myself feel really important, like that definition of rest at the beginning. I'm going to go, I'm going to do, I'm going to find my worth in all these things. You can do that until your blood pressure rises so exponentially that you die of a heart attack, and it will still not make your worth any better than what God already gave you, that you are his, that you are important, that you matter, that you are valued, that you are loved, that he is for you. And we embrace a false identity and we do it in all these things. Gosh, I watched so many people on social media before I jumped off of it. Their identity, they're going to, they got this online business and I got this stuff and I'm going to do, 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 and I'm going to make it right. And I'm like, but Jesus loves you. You need to quit selling me some oils and stuff. Like, Jesus loves you. Like, quit doing things, like all this stuff. And I'm not trashing that, but like, I watch people and I've watched some people that that's all they do. Oh, I got to go to this, I got to go to that. And whether they get wrapped up in this, I'm like, those oils will not save you. And you embrace this false narrative of identity. I watch this especially with females in the realm of believing that their value is in this comparison life. That that mom does that and that woman does that in that relationship. And so they got to run that race. Ladies, I want to let you know that your identity is in Jesus. And you don't have to keep up with the other moms. Those other moms are at home, probably calling up their counselor, probably taking medication. There's nothing wrong with that. Like they're probably doing all those things behind the scenes and you just see the highlight reel because nobody's posting on social media, hey, so I had a panic attack today and everything was awful and my kids melted down and all I want to do is just crawl into a hole and die. Like nobody's posting that. Okay, everybody's posting, everything's fine. Look at our trip. It's amazing. What they don't post is the four hours that their kid had a breakdown and they want to just be like, I'm going to send you to Jesus and all that stuff. And, but you, you don't see any of that. And so you compare yourself with that. And I want you to stop embracing. And then guys, you are more than the jersey that you wear going out into the woods and, ar, 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 and sitting around the pub and all this stuff. God designed you to lead and be strong and amazing. And sometimes that strength means that you cry. Sometimes that strength and that identity means that you build up other men. Sometimes that strength means that you surrender to God and not your own way because you know that God is good. But it also leads to these pieces, and this is the biggest one, of trekking out alone. Like that guy I read that message about that emailed me. And this happened even in my own life. <sighs> From that moment in second grade, when I sat out and, and those moments happened, and I still, these, these things, now I see it, and, and I've found freedom in this. I can go out in, in the dark and look at the stars, and uh, my wife loves to sleep with the TV on, but when it's off... Uh, I can sleep in a dark room. I can go into place like I'm a grown man and that's finally happening for me. But I watch people trek out alone because they think they can do it. 
And it never fails. I watch people circle back around. They come here, they engage. Life gets good, like the guy that emailed, and then they go off, oh, it's fine, I'll come back at the end of summer. Then they don't. I watch three, four years go by, five years. You know what happens? People circle around. Why? Because God is still God, and the truth is still truth. And I don't go like, oh, man, they left. What's going on? I go, nope, if they really want to follow God, they'll be back. And sure enough, it's death and taxes. Circling back around, hey, so, and they, I, I say, you don't have to say a word. It's just like when Jesus was meeting with this woman. He shouldn't have been talking to her in the first place culturally because they were from two completely different people groups. And on top of that, in that particular context of culture, men and women would not be associated in this way. And he stops at this well and this woman's there. And well, she... She would have been, uh, for all intent and purposes, she would have been the best candidate to be a prostitute. She led a loose lifestyle. She was that person. She had been married multiple times, and the person that she was living with at the current time was not her husband. And so as they're engaging in this conversation, she's going to get water. He asks for a drink, and she's like, you're not, basically, like, you're not supposed to be talking to me, and whatever, and he, hey, could, and he's like, I don't have anything to get it with. Do you have something to go home? He's like, oh, can you get it from your husband? And she's like, oh. and she starts to realize that he is more than a normal man, that he is truly Jesus. Uh, She even realizes that he's a prophet. And I don't know if you've ever been around, I've been in these scenarios where people hanging out will do whatever, whether it's going to a show or hanging out, you know, at a pub and people be talking whatever and they'll be cursing up a storm and staying all these stories. And then all of a sudden they're like, hey, this is my pastor. And all of a sudden they meet Jesus in a hurry. They're like, oh, I'm so sorry, whatever, which I I don't even think twice about it because I live my life, you live your life. If you want to follow Jesus, that's fine, but I'm not going to make you. I'd suggest that you probably need to walk that way because it's way better. But you'd go do it, you do you. Um, until it ends badly, and then you'll circle around in a few years, and we'll have a seat for you. And uh, and she meets she meets God. She gets super spiritual when she realizes she's like, "You're a prophet." He's like, "Yeah." You're like, man, you're living with not your husband. She's like, "How do you know that?" He's like, "What if I told you that you could have water and never be thirsty again?" She's like, "Where's that well at?" And I love Jesus' response. This next verse that we're about to read is a synopsis of what I hope for you. It's a synopsis of the next four weeks. It's what I've learned after decades of pain, hurt, anguish, frustration, trying to, like a dartboard, just throwing things at faith, hoping that it sticks, having questions and doubts and pain and all of this. She asked, where can I get that? I don't want to thirst anymore. Jesus responds to her, I am he. You don't have to wait any longer or look any further. For every single one of us in this room and watching online, that existential question of what am I supposed to do with this life? What matters? I think all kinds of things are absolutely amazing. I love technology. I love sports. I love, love, love my wife, my kids, three beautiful girls. Why did God give me those beautiful girls? I don't deserve them. But you know what? At the end of the day, if I try to supplement my life with any of those, I will fail 100 times out of 100. Because the only one that satisfies that will give you rest, no matter where you've looked, is Jesus. And it starts not with rest. It starts, and we watch people all the time in this horse trough here, which has never had actual animals near it, where we watch people say, I believe in God. Now, I watch people say, I believe in God, and I watch people get baptized. This moment where it it symbolized this death to self and this resurrection moment connecting back to the cross and the beauty that is God conquering death. But if we say the words and, and do the thing, it means nothing if we don't fully trust that Jesus is who he says he is and that God did what he said he was going to do and that you and I can have complete redemption and freedom. And that is why restoration 
true restoration that we believe leads to glorious rest. And for many of us, we believe a false definition of rest, which means we believe a false definition of Jesus, which is why we put Jesus on our calendar and not as a part fully of our life. But I want to let you know that Jesus is enough. That you can find rest. See, I, for, I forgave that person in the things that they did. I live in freedom from that. When I look out at the stars, I don't see a false narrative. I see what God created. See so that God gives me rest, and God can give you rest too. But you can't have rest without Jesus. And that can start right now today. Would you pray with me? Thanks for tuning in to the Forefront Church video podcast. Our hope and prayer is that this has left you encouraged and challenged you in your faith. And you might have some questions and some ways that you want to figure this out. And we want to help with that. Head over to ForefrontChurch.info and there's a couple different ways that you can connect. Click the connect tab and let us know how we can be praying for you or a staff member can be contacting you this week. Maybe you have just been encouraged by this and want to support the ministry here at Forefront Church. You can click the giving tab as well as other tabs that are in there to help you along in your journey with God. And so we're thankful for you. Thanks for tuning in. And we cannot wait to see you again here online on the video podcast. We love you and we'll see you then.